charge of all the domains, ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Numbers and Names, recently approved, or tentatively approved, are you ready? 1,900 new generic top level domains like .arp, .aaa, .abc, .able, and so on. Literally, quite literally meaning that if this gets approved, someone will be able to register domain name .able, domain name .academy. And so later in the list, there are 1,900 of them. For example, I represent the Idaho Lottery. Somebody sought to protect the generic top level domain .lotto. The Idaho Lottery is aggrieved to think that somebody will register Idaho Lottery .lotto or um, um, Powerball .lotto or Idaho Scratch .lotto. You see what I mean? So, so we now not only have to worry about the finite universe of 22 generic top level domains and the country code top level domains when these come online, they could dot insurance. What about Hartford Insurance? Do you think they would be aggrieved if somebody got Hartford dot insurance and they didn't? Sure. Now, that's a very high level concern. It probably doesn't impact anybody in this room. But remember that at some point, people will probably be, maybe you'll hit, maybe, maybe who knows, 10 years from now, maybe we'll have a billion dollars because one of your things takes off. The point is, is that at some point, the universe of stuff to the right of the dot is going to expand and include 1,900 words. They're just plain old words in the dictionary. <laughs> OK, now we move to the thing that really everybody's very interested in, copyrights. So most of you as makers deal with copyrights, probably more so the trademarks and domain names and patents. So let's talk aggressively about copyrights for just a minute here. <clears throat> what, what is a copyright? Like a trademark, copyright is not a verb. Copyright is a noun as well. Like trademark, a copyright springs into existence when a sufficiently creative idea is reduced into or onto a tangible media. There it is. That's the definition. That's what a copyright is. It's kind of like magic. So let me ask the question. How many of you own copyrights? You should all raise your hands. Everybody raise your hand. <laughs> you all own copyrights. But you're saying, but Brad, I've never paid any money to a governmental agency. But Brad, I've never mailed to myself an envelope. But Brad, I've never put Circle C on it. But Brad, I haven't copyrighted anything with the government. See, those are, all, those are all wrong concepts. Each of you own copyrights by virtue of the act of creation. So when you print one of your designs on a t-shirt, or when you sculpt clay, or you write code, or you take a photograph, or you make a jar of pickles, or whatever you do, you're, you are literally creating out of the ether a copyright. An incorporeal property right that literally springs into existence. It's a noun. You create it. You're a maker. You make copyrights, literally. And you own them, and you may, in, you may sell them, you may borrow money against them. They, you're literally creating an intellectual property right out of thin air when you take a sufficiently creative idea and reduce it into or onto a tangible medium. So now let me ask again, how many of you own copyrights? All of you do. All of you, you sir, right now are literally creating a copyright, <laughs> simply by the act of writing notes. <laughs> Dean is creating a copyright. He's the author, and he owns a copyright in those notes. Jenny is literally creating a copyright right now in the video that she's taking. Jenny's the author, she owns the copyright. But wait a minute, you're saying, Brad, don't you own the copyright? No. I do not have any copyright interest in the video that she's taking. Why? Let me test your knowledge. Why? You're not creating. That's exactly right. Who said that? Very good. I am not the author because I'm not the one reducing it to a tangible medium. She is. So what if Dean were Dean was a master? transcriptionist and writing down every word that I said. Who would own the copyright in that? Dean. Good. But if all I'm doing is verbatim writing down what your notes are in the media that you produced, then you change my hypothetical. Okay. But that's but that's right. If all you were doing was if, if I if my whole presentation was written out your prose and you were just literally copying it, then you're right. You wouldn't be you wouldn't you'd be committing copyright infringement at that point actually. That sounds so much Better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What about the way your image is portrayed? You're an actor, she's filming you. Is that a different issue? That's a very subtle issue. Copyright actually does protect choreographed dance. You can have a copyright in a choreographed dance to the extent there's actually a language that they use to write down, Trey McIntyre uses it to write down dance steps. You, you just like just like sheet music, you know, music, dance steps. That thing, because that's now tangible, right? He's now taken the dancing and made it tangible by writing it into that language. You can have a copyright in that thing. But again, because movements themselves are not tangible, then no, no copyright exists in that. 
what if I come I can't take pictures of actors in Shakespeare? Your wife takes pictures of actors? No, 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 no. How come I cannot take pictures of actors performing in Shakespeare? Is that related to that? Well, let's, first of all, you, you can. I mean, you physically can, right? As opposed to may versus can. You, you can. The reason you probably are prohibited from doing so is because, A, your contract, you have a contract with Shakespeare when you buy a ticket. It's a contract matter. And it says, thou shalt not. You know what I mean? I would, I would assume, I mean, we could really analyze the intellectual property issues there, but I, I'm guessing it's a, it's a contract issue because your ticket says you can't. That's every ticket to every company. When you go to a concert, the ticket you buy says you cannot record the proceeding. That's why. It's a contract issue, not an IP issue. Yeah. Shakespeare does contract with a videographer to record whatever it's supposed to use. So, yes. so good. Shakespeare, Shakespeare hires a videographer to record the production. Who owns the copyright in the production? in that videotape. Shakespeare. Nope. Videographer. Videographer. Because he's the author. But wait, I know what you're going to say. Well, all of you want to say this. You want to say, but wait, Shakespeare paid for it. You all, it's, it's, it's ready to just bubble forth from your lips. But wait, Shakespeare paid for it. Doesn't matter. Copyright law does not care who paid for it. They don't care. Now, there's a subtlety here we'll get into in a minute. Copyright does not care who paid for it. Copyright asks, who's the author? And the author is the one who reduced it to a tangible medium. Doesn't matter who paid for it. So you should all be thinking, hmm, what copyrights do I now recognize I own that I didn't think I owned five minutes ago? Because I'm the author of something, and you thought until five minutes ago I was paid for it, therefore I was divested of my copyright. That's completely wrong. I get five calls a week from people who say, well, who owns the copyright? And the first question I ask is, who's the author? And then we go from there. I never ask who paid. It doesn't matter. Yeah. What if you're creating something well under the employment of somebody else? Oh, that, well, that's, that that's very good, sir. Very good. It's almost as if I paid you to ask that question right now. It's a perfect <laughs> segment. <laughs> so here are some copyright hypotheticals. You may have said one or more of these. These are all incorrect. I copyrighted my book by putting circle C on the bottom of the first page. That's, that's just completely erroneous and wrong. The picture's on the internet, so I can just right-click and use it on my website. Wrong. That's copyright infringement. I copyrighted this DVD by mailing it to myself. It's wrong for a whole lot of reasons. He's using copyright as a verb, and mailing it to yourself has no bearing on the issue. And we don't have any copyrights because we never registered anything. Again, wrong. You now know that copyright springs from the act of creation. So you may have heard others say some of these things. To be clear, these are all incorrect. So don't allow yourself to think that any of these are right or use any of these un untruths. So when you create a copyright, what's your name, you sir? Brent. Brent? Yeah. Brent owns a copyright in those notes that he's creating. He's not put a circle C on it. He's not paid any money to a governmental agency. He owns a copyright. By, simply by virtue of the act of authorship, Brent, you're the only one who may do these things with respect to those notes. The only one who may lawfully do those things. You're the only one who may make copies of those notes, lawfully. You're the only one who may create derivative works, which means take your notes and turn it into a stage play or a screenplay or write a novel. That's a derivative work, right? Distribute copies. If you printed up 10 copies, nobody can just go hand them out. You're the only one. Publicly perform the work. If that were a play, you'd be the only one who could publicly perform it. <clears throat> display the work. If that were a painting, you'd be the only one who could display it. And we've talked about circle C, how it doesn't mean anything. So simply by virtue of the act of creation, you're the only one who may do those five things. Isn't that remarkable? You don't have to do anything other than create the work, have it in a tangible medium. You're the only one who may lawfully do those things. Yeah. Does a copyright have an exclusive use component? Yes. Each, each of these contemplates some kind of use of the work. It doesn't say use, but publicly just perform would be a form of use of the work. Display would be a form of use of the work. Make copies would be a form of use of the work, if I'm answering your question. How do you guard that exclusivity? If you do produce a piece of art, someone copies your piece of art. You're the only one who may make copies. So, see exclusive rights. You're the only one who may make copies. How do you, how do you enforce your exclusive? Oh, okay. Rights? All right. We'll talk about that. Yeah. Very good. But we got to get to this point first, and then we'll answer your very specific question. So now, in general, the author owns the copyright. We've talked about that. The author owns the copyright, and here are the exceptions. These are these are big exceptions. Unless, as you said, sir, the work is authored by an employee. Brent, are you an employee of anybody in your capacity here today? Your capacity here today. Yeah. So then Brent owns the copyright in those works. But what if he worked for, what if he was an actual employee of Maker Faire? 
not a 1099 guy, a W-2 guy, an employee, then who owns the copyright in those notes Brent's taking? Maker Fair. Maker Fair, because they're the employer. That's the difference. Or if the work is a work made for hire, this is the most abused term in all of copyright law. People misuse this egregiously. A work made for hire is specifically defined in, in the code, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Or the author assigns the copyright in a signed writing. Those are the three ways we take the ownership of the copyright away from Brent and give it to a third party. Brent's an employee, if the work is a work made for hire, or if Brent signs a contract giving the rights to somebody else. So have any of you ever done any work for anybody as an independent contractor? Taken a photograph, written code, okay. <clears throat> Who owns the copyright? The person who hired you. Pardon me? No, Those who hired you. Contract. No? No? No. Specifically, no. Because how many of you have worked as independent contractors? Raise your hands. Independent contractors. Okay. So who owns the copyright? You do. The contractor does because they weren't employees. Mm. So, see? It's not a work made for hire, as we'll show in a minute. And I'm assuming that you didn't sign away a sign a contract that gave away your rights. Maybe you did. Did you? No. No. So, there you go. So, all right, awesome. See, no, but I know that. It, I know if I did. But they see they think because they paid you for it, they own it. Yeah. That's wrong. That's completely wrong. So if you ever act as an independent contractor, so that's why this word is so important. See why I underline employee. That's the key, right? That's why I asked if you act as a 1099 independent contractor, and if you don't give it away in a contract, you own the copyright. Uh, what if you were an independent contractor and you developed something uh, for a company and then they hired you on? Uh, would the work that you do after that be oh. your own or or? That's a very own? interesting question. You'd actually own the copyright in the works you created before you became an employee. Right. But they would own the copyright in the derivative works that you create after you become an so employee. So it's split from that point on. That's exactly. That's literally what you do. You split, that's exactly, and that's what the court would do. They would split it up. Okay, now, let's see, I think I've got a definition of work for hire. See, this is why it's so boring. This is what a work for hire actually is. People just misuse this term. It's a very specific statutory thing. So what it is, there are two parts to it. The work has to be made as a contribution to a collective work, as a part of a motion picture or other audiovisual work. First of all, it has to fall into one of these categories, and the parties have to agree in a writing that it's a work for hire. So for example, if you just write code, for example, code is none of these things. I know this. Code is not one of these things. So code is not going to be in the definition of a work for hire. Therefore, it will never become a work made for hire. Can you define collective work? Uh, yeah, that's like an encyclopedia, where everybody writes an article and they slap it together and do a collective work. So there you go, right? So it's unusual for people to create, unless you are a videographer. A videographer would clearly be square in there. So let's talk about videographer. Motion picture or other audiovisual work. So, to your point, when you create a, a, a videotape, when you videotape something, you're creating an audiovisual work. But see, that's not the whole test. You've also got to have a signed contract between the videographer and the putative owner that says this is a work for hire. If, if that's missing, it doesn't matter if it's an audiovisual work. You've got to have both pieces for it to be a work for hire and divest the videographer of the copyright. Okay. When do I not need permission? This is always important as well. I have a question yeah, about that. Ahead. So say I was hired to, to produce something, and then that we didn't have that contract that said work for hire, that I do own it, and then I can resell it yep. or make a profit from it. You okay. bet. Okay. And they would be upset. And they would call me and say, this guy we hired is using our stuff. And I would say, who's the author? Yeah. And as the author, it's good. Like, I don't ever bring it up unless I let them bring it up. Right. So each of you as makers, each, of, each time you create something that's creative, you own a copyright. That's the point I'm making here. And unless you give it away or you're an employee, you own the copyright. And now I'll answer your question. The way you stop somebody from using that, that photograph or that picture that you've created and, and enforce your exclusive rights is you have to sue them for copyright infringement. You just, that's, that's your remedy. You can, it's just like no different than patents. But see, unlike patents, which take three years and fifteen thousand dollars, copyright is immediate. You own it upon the act of creation. That's the difference. Um, back to the uh, employer-employee question. I guess. Yeah. Um, what if you're in a partnership or, what, or a corporation, 
and you're at, say, the top level and you create something, is it still yours or is it belong to the corporation? Got to ask you, are you an employee? Not if you're like a partner, right? If you're the employer, you might have people working for you. Well, if you're not an employee, then it's not covered by the work for hire doctrine. And so it's literally that right. literal that it's employer, employee, and that's. Yeah. So people, clients will form like LLCs or corporations and they'll become members or shareholders. And they'll think for some reason that just by virtue of the act of being a member of an LLC or a shareholder in a corporation that the entity that they've created owns the copyright. That's not true. It's the individual. The statute says employee. You have to be an employee for the employer to own the copyright. And the, and the test of whether you're an employee or not is very specific. The IRS has very specific promulgated regulations about whether you're an employee or not. And you've got to meet all those tests. The, the guy trying to get the copyright has to meet all those tests to prove that you're an employee. Yeah? Uh, to what extent is copyright employed in mechanical devices? Mechanical devices, it does not. Something that's kinetic? No. No. Copyright protects, cr cr um, well, let me, let's break that down. If you have a device that's kinetic, sitting on a table, and you take a photograph of it, you can protect a copyright in the photograph of the thing. Or, if it has a life as a sculpture, apart from its life as a useful article, then you can protect the copyright in it as a sculpture and not a useful article. Copyright law specifically excludes from protection useful articles. So a kinetic device which has a useful life, apart from its creative life, it cannot be copyrighted. You cannot register the copyright. But kinetic sculptures do get copyright protected. They, they do, because they have a life apart from their life as a useful article. So what about a teapot? Could you, could you register a copyright in a teapot? No, it's a useful article. But what if it's got some really ornate designs on the outside and a really neat sculpture of an eagle on the little thing that makes it whistle? What about that? That's distinct and apart from the useful article, and you could copyright that. See how I even use copyright as a verb? You could register the copyright in those aspects. See, it's very, very, it's very esoteric and very granular, but these are just high-level tests. Okay, quickly, because we're running out of time here. When do I not need permission? You may use somebody else's stuff, even if they have a copyright in it, if it is in the public domain, or if your use is a fair use, or if the original work is not protected by copyright. Those three. Yeah. This also applies if someone has released the work under a uh, Creative Commons license. No. No? Specifically, no. Um, you do not need permission if to use the work if it's in the public domain, and Creative Commons is not that. Mm -hmm. Fair use, Creative Commons is not that. And original is not protected by copyright. Original is not protected by copyright. Creative Commons is not that. What Creative Commons is, is a licensing scheme where they are granting you permission. You still need permission. They are granting you permission by virtue of a thing called a Creative Commons license. But to be clear, simply because you see Creative Commons on there doesn't mean that you may use it or copy it. Or, it's a very specific grant of rights owned by the, administered through the Creative Commons license. So let's be clear. When you see Creative Commons, it doesn't mean that it's you know, no holds barred, use it any way you want. Creative Commons is just simply a way of articulating the kinds of rights that the owner of the copyright is giving you. Ah. Okay. So here is the definition of fair use. And I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. This is why you're all going to have to call me and get a copy of the deck or email me and I'll send you a copy <laughs> of the deck. Public domain is not a place. People always mess up on what public domain is. They think something's in the public domain, but it's, it's not many times. The, a work of authorship is in the public domain if it is no longer under copyright protection or if it failed to meet the requirements for copyright protection in the first place. So it's very, very tricky to say if something is in the public domain because 90% of the time it's not. It has to be one of those two categories of works. Either it's no longer under copyright protection typically because it's old, something eventually will fall out of copyright. This happens a lot with uh, old movies. Right, very good. And yeah. then you'll see like, you know, your Netflix or Amazon, then it'll right. flood the market with all these And, and that's why it's so popular for the filmmakers to make movies based on old novels. Yeah. Shakespeare, Jane Eyre, the Bible, you know, that's why. They don't have to pay anybody for the rights. Yeah. Because <laughs> they're in the public domain. Okay, well here you go. We'll, I think we'll probably conclude on this point. Creative Commons and licensing. Licensing is a, simply a mechanism by which the owner of a copyright gives permission to a third party to use that right. That's all it is. So a Creative Commons is one way that somebody can grant you those rights. So let's assume that you are a photographer and 
you put your photographs on your website. You may sign up through Creative Commons to grant people who come to your website a Creative Commons license in your photographs to use them under the strictures of the, the Creative Commons license. That's all it is. You go to creativecommons.org, you sign up, you find which kind of license you want to use, you stick the little logo on your website, and bada bing, people may use your stuff, but it's under the strictures of the Creative Commons license. Mary? So the Creative Commons website has a variety of choices, yep. and you are free to use what's on those one of those choices with your own. Yes. You, you literally go to creativecommons.org, you sign up, you pick the kind of license that you want, you pick a little um, snippet of code, which is a link back to their website, you embed that on your website, it creates the logo to display, 